welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for How I Got Here, Mozio and Focuswire's weekly podcast about innovators in travel and transportation. Today, we have Jamie Wong with us. Jamie founded Viable in 2010. Viable was the first and largest global marketplace for unique experiences offered by everyday people. Since Viable, Jamie's collaborated with Van Jones on Project Empathy and founded the Narrative Fund with Eric Blatchford uh, to invest in early stage consumer tech companies. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Thanks so much for having me. So we like to start these interviews off the same way every time, which is for us to ask you how you got here. Sure. So I started Bible back in 2010, so a decade ago. And, um, you know, it's amazing how much more as time goes on, I realize I need to really contextualize the setting of of Silicon Valley in 2010, because even though it doesn't feel like that long ago, uh, things were drastically different. There were a small handful of companies in San Francisco, consumer tech companies. Um, Most of them were still Silicon Valley, um, the Valley itself, um, Palo Alto, Menlo Park were still considered really the uh, ground zero of startups. Um, So it was already odd to be in San Francisco. the sharing economy, I don't think that phrase existed yet um, or was just kind of gaining some traction, collaborative consumption. There was a lot of sort of ideology around this um, as a movement, but it was brand new and kind of seen as very cutting edge. Um, And I was coming in from no tech background, really a storytelling background, a liberal arts major, and um, with a strong passion for travel. I'd been to 35 countries and volunteered, worked, lived abroad, and um, had sort of been become known in my network of friends and extended network as the travel person who would help connect people with people I'd met, locals around the world. And um, I guess I just developed this itch to make it something more to expand this network just beyond my own inner circle and saw the opportunity in the market as well to create a kind of platform that can enable these kinds of interactions. Um, Airbnb had just launched a year or two prior. So there was sort of signals in the market and and they had just uh, raised their series A when I was starting Viable. So Sequoia had invested in them and they had done Y Combinator. And so there were these signals in the market in in the startup ecosystem that um, a crazy idea like this could actually maybe get some attention from venture capitalists and and in in the tech world. So um, I worked on, I started working on Bible, building up the community and kind of moonlighting um, while I had a day job at an ad agency writing copy. Quit my day job and took the plunge to work on it full time. And um, then the roller coaster began. Okay, thanks ever so much for joining us, Jamie. I mean, um, you talked about you know, a, a couple of things you did beforehand. And one of the things I'm always interested in with any kind of founder is within their kind of pre-founding period, if there is anything from their old jobs that informed the way they created the company. And, you know, you can't help but notice on your LinkedIn that you were a producer on the daily show with John Stewart. So the, the, the obvious question is, is there anything in particular from that, that period of working in satire comedy and live television that helped you uh, um, think about how you're going to create a uh, peer to peer marketplace in tours and activities? Well, thanks for asking that question, Kevin, because believe it or not, I would say of all my jobs and lives prior to starting Viable, that was actually the most relevant. And I don't mean that in a (laughs) cheeky kind of way. Um, Yeah, I actually, so at The Daily Show, it was my job to come up with stories that 
you know, surface the hypocrisy in government public figures in the media. Um, and that, you know, finding characters that then can help kind of depict a larger story of what was going on in society. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, anyone who's familiar with The Daily Show understands it's a comedy show. It's quite provocative. Um, and, you know, it's really meant to be a little bit controversial. And so I took that same format when I started Viable. I hired a team of interns. So unlike... John, I didn't have a room of uh, Emmy Award winning writers and producers, but I had some really scrappy interns in uh, the front room of a Victorian that another white combinator company had rented out and just let us squat in their front room with like kind of crappy internet in a whiteboard. And I just walked them through our daily show format, basically, of how I would go around sourcing stories and ask them. We started building Bible in San Francisco where we were based. So ask them, you know, tell me what is the story of the city? Who are the most compelling characters? And who are those characters that are going to depict a larger story that has consequences and that's maybe edgy and controversial and there's maybe even some kind of contradiction or hypocrisy. And so we would brainstorm these stories and then um, each intern would take kind of a handful and go pursue and find that person who is, you know, um, for instance, we talked about how homelessness is a big um, part of the city, and yet it's sort of annexed. And you have on, you know, within blocks of one another, you know, very uh, millionaire tech bros, and then a homeless shelter. And um, how do we kind of surface that paradox and that awkwardness and hypocrisy? And rather than trying to pretend like as a tourist destination, San Francisco is just these tourist sites or this, you know, tech startup crawl or just this, this, you know, cesspool. <laughs> um, how do we kind of talk about all of these things together and surface this, this paradox? And so we found a homeless guy and, um, he was living in a, in a shelter in the Tenderloin, and we asked him if he would um, be interested in sharing his story and showing people around his neighborhood and that we would actually pay him for it. And he was thrilled. So we started offering this. It got some pushback in the press, but I, saw, I held pretty firm on this because I knew exactly, um, you know, the stories that become controversial in the press are actually the ones that are tapping into some kind of truth and it makes people feel uncomfortable and awkward. So this was actually kind of the, um, the foundation and ideology that drove Viable and the experiences, the content, and the community that we built. And all of that really stemmed from my time at The Daily Show. Now, it's interesting, I mean, for fear of continuing on this thread, but it's a really interesting kind of super early stage story from a startup. I mean, when you got that pushback or that kind of negative reaction from the press about what you were doing i mean it's not great some would argue to get negative press within the first x number of months of a business kind of launching i mean did that tell you more about the press that you were going to have to deal with or did it tell you more about the drive that you as you just referenced that you wanted to maintain it signaled to me that we were on to something right because it was capturing people's attention. It felt relevant enough and important enough to write about. And it was making people feel uncomfortable because they didn't know what box to put us into. And to yeah. me, these are all really positive signs that you're onto something where there could be some product market fit. No, interesting. I mean, then how, um, how soon after kind of launching was this kind of this activity in the press and what you were doing with this, with this particular guy, was it very, really super early then? This was probably a week after launching on TechCrunch. <laughs> okay. very early. I think our revenue was probably at that point cumulative, you know, $1,200. Um, so, you know, it's funny telling these stories. I actually, um, this happened to me one time, I was asked at Y Combinator. We did Y Combinator the summer of 2012. 
And um, against some interesting odds, we were able to raise a $2 million seed round and did it pretty effectively. And the partners at Y Combinator asked me to be on a panel, um, you know, just giving advice to founders on how to fundraise. And I realized that um, telling my personal story and how I did it um, was a little bit dangerous because it didn't exactly apply to everyone, um, my style. And so I'm, I'm quite aware of this here where I wouldn't want to recommend to anyone that they necessarily just try to get any press as good press or, you know, a, a week into launching, um, create some kind of controversy. I think, you know, there are a lot of um, disadvantages I had as a founder and, um, you know, assets that I don't have that other founders do. Um, but I leaned on one that I do have, which is my ability to tell a story and navigate a narrative. And, um, you know, it just was one of those, those things. You got to be resourceful and play to your strengths. And I also had, you know, I have a master's in journalism and had lots of interaction with the press in the past. So I kind of, it didn't scare me. So I want to actually come back to that later point because I think there's some really interesting things to delve into there, but I wanted to kind of continue on the story of uh, how Viable evolved. You see, you just kind of touched on that 2012 Y Combinator. You, um, you raised a $2 million round. Um, could you kind of go through, you know, the various next stages of, uh, you know, very big, big moments, how you grew, scaled, and I think you eventually shut the company down in 2017, right? In 2019. 2019, okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, it's so hard because, you know, what makes um, the kind of nice, pithy story is um, sort of doing a disservice in a way, I think, because um, the arc is just not that clean. And, I mean, there's so many ups and downs. And, you know, even just me saying I raise a, $2 million seed round. Um, that's accurate. And we did. We closed it right after demo day um, in September of 2012. But I had been pitching on and off for a year and a half. And I had, you know, raised some money from SC Angel maybe eight or nine months prior. Another kind of small tranche came in from a few other angels. Um, and, you know, we we're able to finally kind of hit it out of the park after Y Combinator. But, um, you know, I'm just very aware for, and, you know, anyone who's started a company, their stories guaranteed are the same, where, you know, you kind of create this timeline because we don't have all day. And um, it's, it, but, but there's so many other cracks and bits and pieces, and it's so much messier than it seems. But um, after... So yeah, I, I had actually also done 500 startups in 2011. And again, this sort of gets edited out of the official viable narrative because, um, you know, there's only so many, you only have so much word count. Um, but that helped us as well um, because it was sort of the first institutional check in. And um, Andrew Chen was a friend of mine um, at the time, you know, he was, saw what we were doing and helping me out and was like, you guys, you should, you know, I'm a mentor at 500 startups. You should really think of applying, got into that. Um, and it kind of created a little bit more credibility for what we're doing. And, and for me as a founder, um, being legit and operating a legit startup. Um, so yeah, then we raised some more money Then the following year did Y Combinator, closed more money. And then it was, um, from there, it was hiring and building a team because up until then it had been me and, um, a sort of revolving door of, um, not the right fit co-founder. And after YC, we built a team and continued to build out the product we rented a new Victorian on Roush Street, which if that sounds familiar, it's because the Airbnb founders um, started Airbnb from a Victorian on that street. So it seemed, or an apartment on that street. 
it seemed maybe auspicious, um, which is so silly and naive to think about in retrospect. <laughs> that you're grasping at straws when you're starting a company and you don't know what, what factors matter. Um, and uh, it, was, it was funny at the time, you know, 2012, 2013, just within a block, there were, I don't know, like 10 different Y Combinator founders um, around similar stage of the business as us. And so we would often get together, we shared the catering of organic lunches and all the ridiculous things that um, the ecosystem kind of pressured us to do to recruit good talent, which I would never do again. And uh, continue to grow the, the platform itself, grow the community. We got to, um, I think probably a million dollar run rate that next year. And um, after summer, as many people who work in uh, travel businesses understand, you know, come late September, revenue dropped drastically. And it was the first summer that we'd actually really experienced any kind of like Vol like real volume. I mean, we've been growing the summer before too, but the numbers were so small as a two person team at this point, it was a seven person team. And that drop, um, I mean, I, we all kind of freaked out. And as the founder and CEO, I didn't pr properly prepare my team. Hey, this is how revenue is going to go. We're a travel business and, um, it's going to go, it's going to be cyclical. So um, we all took a huge morale hit and um, another lesson learned probably a little too late that um, again, kind of back to it's, you know, no aspect of this is this nice, clean evolutionary curve. Um, the startup story, nor, nor the traction or anything. Um, so that took some, some recovering and kind of repositioning. I'm interested in something you said, Jamie, if I may, going back a couple of minutes, you said a revolving door of founders or potential founders. Um, you, can't, you, flip, flip yeah, you, can, you can't leave that one hanging there without explaining either why you had such a revolving door of founders or, um, you know, how did you settle on the final one? I suppose revolving door is a little bit for a dramatic effect. It's not inaccurate, but it was not, you know, slews of co-founders. Um, <laughs> there were a couple, but it certainly, um, it was in a very short period of time. And, you know, they were not right matches because I had just, it took a while like it does when you're dating and everyone always create this analogy, but it's, I can't think of a better analogy. In fact, um, my co-founder relationships have probably been way more important and, um, and profound and messy than any of my romantic relationships. <laughs> but, you know, it takes a while to get to know someone, but get to know someone in the capacity of um, co-founding a company, being in the pressure cooker, which is a startup. And then all the different phases of the startup, of growing, of fundraising, of hiring. Um, each of these can be massive triggers where you either can, you know, you find alignment or you diverge at any of these points. And so until you've gone through those cycles with someone, it's actually very difficult. It's easy to know who's not the right match, but it's really hard to know who's the right one. You kind of have to go through those different cycles. And... Um, you know, so there was a learning curve there. And I, you know, I am not a tech bro. I um, did not go to engineering school. I didn't play video games nonstop growing up and then built my own video games. Um, and so dipping, you know, my, my professional and personal network are like liberal arts majors and journalists and, and comedians and media people. And, um, you know, it, it, I didn't have this automatic kind of social network of people to just tap into and be like, hey, let's start a company. That's interesting, though, if I may. Sorry. Um, is that you saying that you felt like you were perhaps a little bit of an outsider, given, you know, the, the, the community that you were operating in 
And, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you kind of maybe deal with it? It sounds a little bit too kind of therapy, but I mean, do you, do you know what I mean? You, you, you're in a different circle. You're going through different founders. I mean, how did you work your way through it? I definitely felt like an outsider. I still do to some extent. I don't think I'm any less of an ex- outsider. I just think that, um, I'm okay with that now in, in a way that I wasn't then. I also think the larger landscape has changed drastically. So I, I actually wanted to kind of like ask something kind of similar to what Kevin asked. Uh, there was a, um, there was an information article that came out a week or two ago about how, I'm not sure if you saw this, I think it was by a woman named Tracy Chow, I think. And she said about how the co-founder hype that's often actually ad- advanced by Y Combinator is a disadvantage to women founders who often come in and can't find a co-founder. And there's this stereotype against funding single founders. And I understand that. I mean, I did, I, I am uh, a computer science major from Berkeley and it was hard for me like uh, honestly like and I think this is you know like I only imagine if you didn't have four years of being in class with the you know co-founder material types so um, like you know I'm curious if you would agree with that op-ed just quickly. Yeah I didn't read that one I will go read it um, but I think I I can imagine the position it's taking um, it's right and why Combinator is also right. And I think, um, you know, why Combinator, I think often they're like what they have created and perpetuated in tech culture and what they have espoused as guidelines and best practices, people often take it as ideology and respond to it in that way. And it's not intended to be, it's actually just hyper pragmatic and just sort of outing out facts and patterns. So um, Y Combinator's right when they say, you're more likely to succeed when you have a co-founder. So we want to invest in companies that have co-founders. Now that's reasonable. And I actually think having a co-founder, I'd have a hard time now that I'm on the other side of the table investing in a single founder. It is just, such a difficult task to build a startup and to not have a partner that's carrying that weight and that can be a sounding board that has just as much skin in the game is um, just, you know, adding an extra mountain on top of a mountain. So, um, but what do we do about that when it clearly, you know, that favors certain people? Well, that's where I think that we can, we have, there's a lot of work we can do and i think just even the understanding that hey it's not actually a failing of me or my inability to execute or my inability to perform as a founder and as an operator it's a function of my background and that's it not it's a function more of my past it's not a function of my future um and so those are some of the biases i do think we need to get rid of to give more people opportunity. Well, so I wanted to go back to something you said earlier about how you you created a little controversy, but it was a sign of a good thing when you, when you, uh, you know, first launched Viable. And this is something I feel like I've spoken to a lot of startup founders about in that um, kind of, you know, when you join an incubator, some people call it mentor whiplash, uh, where you get, you know, tons of different advice from, you know, every single different quarter corner, you know, someone telling you to go left one day and the next day, equally qualified person telling you to go right. Um, and I think that I've talked about this with my team where sometimes I'll get feedback and I'll reject it out of hand because I've already kind of looked at it from that perspective. And I already know I don't agree with it. Other times I'll be kind of like, okay, you know what, that's actually something we should consider. And it sometimes comes down to brand values and comes down to, when it comes, bringing it back to what you said about controversy, are you okay with the controversy you're stoking? Or is it a real controversy you should actually probably take as a signal that you're really off, off kilter in some way? And I'm curious how you thought about figuring out what kind of controversy you were okay with and what, how did you structure those brand values? Because you know, clearly either you made a decision being like, you know what, I'm fine being known for that. And I know some people might not like it, but those people aren't our people. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really important aspect of um, probably any founder's journey. 
for me, it took a lot of reckoning and a process of trying to be self-aware to sort this through. And um, ultimately, the thing that helped me the most, and, you know, by the way, I don't think I, you know, succeeded. I think it's a, it's a path, and I probably, you know, was better in some moments than others along the way. But, um, you know, one of Ben Horowitz's, I mean, I read his blog religiously when I was starting Viable, and um, one of his blog posts on a CEO's number one job is managing your own psychology. I mean, the headline already says everything, but it's definitely a highly recommended read. Um, for me, it really became, I had to ask myself all the time, is this, what is the reason to do this? Is this serving a business need or an emotional need? And that sounds a little bit like, wait, really? Shouldn't that be obvious? But it is amazing how founders and, and you know, operators, executives too, um, we can trick ourselves. I mean, the ego is like a very, very sharp, you know, um, mischievous thing. And it's quite powerful in anyone who starts a company, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, and the more successful we become, the more empowered the ego becomes. And um, just stepping back and asking constantly, because, you know, I, I mean, you become really skilled at building a case to support a, a business decision. But before you're pushing for that, you know, for me, it always came down to, is this serving an emotional need or a business need? And then if it served a business need, then it was a matter of making a decision of, you know, is this something that in my heart and gut and I can maintain integrity to stand behind, even if it's going to be hard? Well, yeah. And if not, if it kind of created those like anxious butterflies in my stomach, then I always knew Mm, this is probably the wrong way. Like this is going to catch up and bite me in the ass at some point. You can only fake it so much. I think that's great advice post uh, Forbes 30 under 30 as everyone tries to compete for the adulation of everyone else, uh, you know, the last week here. Um, you know, I, I wanted to come back to a little bit to your business model a little bit. So you mentioned Airbnb at the beginning, sharing economy at the beginning as well. Um, I remember when you got you first launched Mozio launched around the same time, uh, 2011 ish, and you know we were very keenly aware of every other travel startup happening there. I remember you guys being described as Airbnb for activities, and um, I remember, you know, clearly there's some differences there. Like Airbnb is like an asset that's just sitting there unused versus uh, activities. It's usually someone's time, and it's not an unused asset laying around, right? So I'm curious if we can go into a little bit of depth here about what was similar and what was different and kind of your core assumptions about, you know, sharing economy and what worked when it applied to activities and what didn't. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, we've all learned a lot in the past 10 years. Luckily, I don't hear the term sharing economy thrown around too much anymore. Um, I, I, I think everyone realizes that that only exists as sort of this, this idea. Because um, we're not actually talking about sharing. We're talking about, you know, well, this week, a $40 billion company that's about to IPO. So that's not sharing. That's commerce, um, first of all. And so you know, the business model, and I think Airbnb has discovered this as well as they have moved into the space and offering activities and tried to incorporate that business model, which will, you know, they have not been able to achieve the scale they've achieved in their lodging business with their activity business. And, um, you know, for us, that was always going to be the case. Um, the tours and activities business at large is massive, but when you take this kind of model of people sharing their time and understanding what's motivating them to do it, and it's not usually paying a mortgage, it's usually actually money is second, and the first thing is their own passion, their pride, connecting with other people. So, you know, it's an interesting situation because in the early days, um, Airbnb's brand message and sort of value promise, um, and they've been insanely successful at branding and propagating this message, 
were, it was those, ex those exact principles of, you know, sharing, connecting, making the world a smaller place, all of us belonging. Um, but that's not actually what's motivating user behavior that's driving the, the, act, the, the largest numbers on their platform. Those things were largely driving user behavior on viable, um, but it turns out it's not as big of a business. So Did you, I, I, I'm curious, I mean, tours and activities, you know, at the turn of the, that decade, you know, 2010 was just when a lot of people really started waking up to it. And I know the peak kind of crazy time was 2014, 2015, 2016. But did you, in that first three or four years, say, Jamie, did you ever think someone who's already got either brand cachet or the marketing muscle, I'm thinking of Expedia, for example, which is an obvious one because it was in tours and activities already, could come along and just do what we're doing just like that? Or did you think that you had something unique potentially that could stay the course? No, I never really actually feared um, competition from the existing OTAs. Right. And I knew they wouldn't be able to do what we were doing because of the way their business model is and their operations are set up, they just simply couldn't. Yeah. So, you know, a bigger threat was going to be another startup always. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, as you said, Airbnb has tried to, has, has been trying or doing this for quite a few years now. Do you think, and you said, you said just then, Jamie, you know, it is actually quite hard and the volume isn't actually quite, as big as perhaps somebody thought. Is that something that um, became apparent quickly or was it more over time? I'm gonna give a lame answer, but both. Right. Um, you know, you never know what is um, making something work or not work because there's so many variables in yep. the moment. And it takes a while to kind of distill that. So, you know, I think there's this myth of the, the myth of meritocracy and, and execution being 100% of everything that gets perpetuated in Silicon Valley. And it's actually, I, I see the value in emphasizing that, um, but it also is quite dangerous. And I think I fell into that trap. Um, you know, it, you know, execution got overemphasized, I think, in, uh, in the sort of echo chamber around me. And that was not um, the primary factor in viable not reaching large scale. Mm -hmm. And we know that now, looking at Airbnb, has the absolute, you know, for us, it was the fantasy distribution. They already have all the users. They own the market. They are a household name, they're a trusted brand, and they can't build the unicorn business out of their tours and activities. Yeah. Despite all of, you know, even, I mean, Brian was so bullish on this. Brian Chesky was really bullish on this too. Um, he wanted to acquire us in the very early days, very, very early days. I mean, he saw this, he believed in it in the same way I did. Not to say there's nothing there to believe in. It's real. But the market dynamics are not analogous to housing. So I, I, a very obvious follow-up here. I mean, so there was some talk of an acquisition then at some point. What Talk us through a little bit about what didn't happen there as it turned out. What didn't happen on three different occasions. All right. Okay. Well, <laughs> tell us the most interesting well, occasion. Well, because of, um, you know, obvious reasons that it was uh, involved two different parties, I can't go into too many details. Sure, yeah. um, but, you know, I can say, I mean, the interest was there. I, mean, I think, you know, Brian's an amazing visionary and um, we were um, really close at the time. He was very generous with his, mm -hmm. his time and guidance and everything with me. And, um, you know, we we work together well and, and uh, talking about business and 
whatever, being on panels together, whatever else, um, and really shared kind of a vision around all of this. So this was very early days where he was like, you know, inevitably we're going to build this business and um, you get it. You're practically part of the Airbnb team. You're friends with everyone here. You, you know, um, are passionate super user. Like let's, I mean, the acquisition at the time was just going to be me and like a handful of users and um, a co-founder. But for various reasons, um, it didn't happen mostly because um, this was super early days and they needed to focus. They weren't ready to build additional business units yet. And I was very, um, I was not pushing for an Apple hire to join their team. I, I wanted to build this business. And so it didn't materialize. Okay. David. So, yeah, I, I found a couple of things you said there fascinating. One is kind of like stated values versus real reasons for success. You said oh, a connection and, uh, you know, all those, those uh, nice uh, cuddly, you know, <laughs> verbs. <laughs> um, I think that this is something I've struggled with with a lot of different stuff is like, you know, Google's, you know, is don't be evil, but really, you know, optimized CPMs would not exactly ring as, you know, uh, you know, virtuous. So I'm curious, how do you balance that when it comes to like, what you would you tell your team? How do you broadcast values versus kind of how do you optimize, you know, in, internally? Like, was there a point in which you were like, okay, people don't really want this. Let's start, you know, like selling them hop on hop off buses uh, or something like that. Or, you know, or I'm curious, how did you balance that? Yeah. So for us, um, you know, me and the team, um, the, hop on, hop off, whatever, you know, other um, tour aggregators, ticketing services and OTAs are selling was never, ever, ever in the conversation or a question because it was so far from what we were building. So it was really more of a question of, do we add in other types of, you know, um, offerings here to increase the margins, increase the basket size that, but it was always about, um, empowering individual stories. It was always about culture and trying to uphold and celebrate it and finding a business model around that rather than, you know, tours and activities as it was traditionally conceived of, of anything that falls into the bucket of something you're doing during the day for one to five hours or something. So that was never, I mean, I, I didn't start the company to do that and no one else did. So um, that was very quickly kind of dismissed as any potential pivot idea. Um, what we did explore, however, was different formats and ways to package what we were doing. So at one point we did start offering um, kind of a sharing economy, travel agency package, whole package uh, tour through our con concierge offering. Um, and that was locals putting together full itineraries and booking them for travelers. Um, they were certainly larger margin because, I mean, anyone who is even remotely in the travel business understands where the biggest margins come from accommodation. So you really want to try to bake that into your offering. Um, but even that, it was always very much about doing something that was different and it was also going to push the industry to expand its vision of what travel can be and what pr travel products and services can look like. I think I remember that. Am I correct in saying British Airways kind of sponsored a, a, a European kind of trip where you guys were gonna work on that product? I think I remember that. Yep, yep, we did that. Yeah, no, I remember at the time, I think I had just closed an angel investor from British Airways Group and I was envious that <laughs> you guys kind of <laughs> to finagle that and the, despite my, my angel investor. Um, but, uh, you know, so there's one, one other thing I want to kind of go back to you said at the very beginning is around storytelling. So I, I think, um, first of all, I love that your, your venture capital funds named the Narrative Fund. I've, um, I feel like I've kind of had numerous conversations about how like controlling the narrative is almost the most important thing and, or the only thing. And I think, you know, thinking about our presidential elections over the last five years here about, you know, what's the reason why one person won or not, it was, you know, really just control over the narrative and not any other stuff. Um, and then I also think, you know, I've come to realize that 
half, if not the vast majority of my job as a CEO and tech founder is figuring out you know, what the right narrative is to either raise money, inspire people, whatever. And that's kind of the be all and end all. And so I would love to hear your feedback. And, and it sounds like you're a kindred spirit to everything I just said, considering your naming. Um, but you know, I would love to hear a little bit about you know, how you think about narrative storytelling and its importance. Yeah, so clearly we, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in investing now in um, early stage, mostly consumer startups with my partner, Eric Blatchford. Um, and uh, we were trying to figure out a name and for the longest time. And it was, I mean, it's almost just comedic to think back on it because it was like we were circling the most obvious thing and just skipped, skipped over it. Um, Because we talk about narrative all the time. In fact, it's central to our thesis. Um, You know, on our website, we say we back great storytellers. But um, that's precisely it. Um, You know, it's it's a framework. And obviously, you know, I think some people can sometimes um, take the idea of narrative um, and storytelling literally as if, all that matters is the outward facing optics or skin. And I don't mean that, that's not what we're talking about, but it's, it's a framework. It's a framework of evaluating startups. It's a framework of operating and building a startup and all the different people where you are accountable to being able to communicate the right narrative. Part of that narrative um, and the data points that construct it is built through your actual execution. So as you just mentioned, David, like, um, I mean, if you're pitching an investor, I mean, the story you tell is mission critical to your success, but you can only tell a good story if you have a, if you have, you know, good characters and a good compelling plot and a good setting. And those things are real. You don't get to make it up. Um, You might be able to win a presidential election making those things up. Um, but in this game, I think you're going to get found out and called out pretty quickly. Um, last one from us then, Jamie, if we can, um, you, you said right at the beginning of the, you're almost right at the beginning of the interview that, you know, Viable was closed down in 2019. I wonder, you know, um, was that a hard thing to do or was it a necessary thing to do given that you've got your new role at the narrative fund? That's the first part of the question. And And I guess the second one was, was that, an emotionally hard thing to do just because, you know, as a, as a founder and a, of a, of a, of a, of a new business, you do get emotionally attached to something or were you quite happy to see it sail off into the sunset by that point? The most touching and difficult question for last. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I actually, we, we sold it to a new buyer without much um, economic outcome. Um, and they were operating it and had me continue as a CEO to continue to operate it. And then we shut it down. And, um, you know, I thought even a non lucrative exit was going to kind of fill some emotional need for me in a way that it didn't. I also, so I overestimated the power of that. Um, I also overestimated no, I underestimated how easy it would actually be to finally shut it down. Um, the anticipation was the worst, but at that point, um, and especially now with COVID, I realized, you know, it's the myth of our startup and how attached we are, our identity to the startup that you're building that creates all of that pain, but it's not actually real. And when it came time to shut it down, it was the right logical, rational decision. Um, And so in a way it was just a relief to not have this, um, you know, kind of, to not continue to be bowing at windmills. Yeah, Uh, very interesting. And uh, a a very nice way to end our interview, Jamie. So uh, uh, thanks again from David and I for joining us, Jamie, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's great to see you both again. Okay. Okay. So 
Okay, so uh, this has been uh, How I Got Here, which is uh, Focus Squire and Mozio's weekly podcast. We're now in season three. It's uh, 2021. Uh, so thank you very much to everybody that is a subscriber. If you're not, you can subscribe in all the usual places, which is iTunes, uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all those kind of places. So uh, come on there and subscribe if you're not already. So we'll be back next week with another episode of How I Got Here. Once again, thanks to Jamie Wong and uh, it's goodbye from David and I and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week. Thank you.